Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. And this is an Atari 800XL home computer. This is sitting on the bench because a friend of mine asked me to have a look at it. He bought this, I think a while ago, for research purposes into the uh, Pokey chip, which we'll describe later what that is. And uh, he doesn't... Uh, he doesn't know much about the Atari home computers and he asked me to hook it up and make sure that it works because he's had it for a while and he didn't know how to hook it up to a TV or anything like that. So uh, here we are and let's see if this is going to be a really short video or not. It also came with a power supply, the big huge brick, which is a linear supply providing 5 volts. Let's see. Yep, 5 volts at 1.5 amps for that size thing. And it's already getting warm. I've had it plugged in for a few minutes. It's warm to the touch already, but uh, well, let's see. Power switch is back here. Power light comes on nothing on the TV. Uh, the TV does work. It didn't come with this. This is mine. I've, I've used it. I use it on and off and I know that I'm hooked up correctly to it. I actually hooked up the camera to it to make sure that both audio and video worked. So uh, that works. This light coming on is a pretty good indication that this works. I mean we gotta go in and check voltages but uh, for all intents and purposes this thing is dead. I mean, this is a typical eBay powers up, i.e. the light comes on, but uh, probably sold as is because I can't, because the seller says I can't test it any further. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is uh, I have a really valuable test instrument here that is probably going to make our diagnosis somewhat easier on this. And here's the test instrument. This is my personal Atari 800 XL that I fixed years ago and that does work. Another good thing about it is all of the ICs in here are socketed. So, well hopefully they're socketed in this one too and uh, we can probably take, we can do some measurements, but we can probably take the cheap way out and start swapping chips to fault isolate this thing. But first, let's make sure that mine works with the new power supply and, of course, you know, with the TV. Let's verify that everything other than the computer in this chain works correctly. All right, I hooked up my guy, and uh, let's see what he does. Okay, so those buzzes you were hearing is, uh, it is trying to read a disk on the uh, serial port, and that's just, it's making a few retries to see if it can get anything, and if it can't, if it can't read the disk, it gives you the ready prompt and drops into basic. So obviously the power supply seems does seem to work. Well, the brick seems to work. And uh, one other thing to try right now is uh, I should probably drag a disk drive in here. But one other thing to try is to put a cartridge in there and see if that works. I happen to have a copy of Gyrus laying around, so let's see this one. And that works. And let's see if we can start again. Oh, I don't know where my joystick is, so... But the bottom line is, is that this guy works. So, 
let's tear into them and see what ails him or her. Here's the main and only PCB. This is what an 800XL looks like. This uh, is the keyboard connector which uses a flex cable that uh, is uh, that friction fits into here. And quick overview is uh, 64K of RAM made up of 64 by 1 DRAMs. Then we have a bunch of custom chips and I numbered them all because if I get to start swapping chips between this and the good machine I don't want to get confused after a while which chip is which I've done the same on my on my own machine because I've used it to troubleshoot other Ataris and it is a very useful thing to do anyway going on we do have in uh, well let's see this one is a 6502 this is the infamous pokey chip which stands for pot and keys and is mainly used to read potentiometers i.e. the paddles you plug into here or the keyboard or buttons from the joystick but it also generates sound which originally was intended to create sounds to uh, write to cassette or create tones for a modem but this chip actually made it into uh, or was used in several Atari arcade games also and uh, has become non-obtainium at this point so uh, this chip usually if this one goes it's usually a problem because if you can find them they tend to get expensive people are beginning to build uh, duplicates or build carrier boards with stuff on it or actually make the chip itself but uh, I think it tends to get a bit expensive so let's hope it's not this guy this is just a 6520 PIA this is yeah we already talked about the 6502 going all the way over here is this is called the Antic and that stands for alphanumeric television interface controller and that along with this the GTIA which is the graphics television interface adapter this is what generates graphics sprites pretty much everything that you see on the screen and the rest of the stuff is basically glue logic there is a uh, there is a PAL here that is marked as the memory controller so we don't want this one to go bad either because it's probably read protected and then we have two PROMs in here one uh, contains the OS there's also self-diagnostic mode in here and the BIOS in general and the smaller one contains BASIC the built-in BASIC that you saw and that pretty much sums up what's inside this machine. So where do we start? Well, I did some quick checks. First of all, making sure that 5 volts is getting to all of the chips and that 5 volts has a low uh, AC component. All of that looked good. Checked for any signs of damage, also looked at the back of the board, see if there were any scratches or anything like that. And uh, nothing untoward showed up. I then put a probe on the processor to see if there was any activity, and uh, there was activity. But, you know, it doesn't mean much. Well, what it means is that the processor is getting the clock and it's running. There seemed to be no stuck lines or anything like that. So I just randomly started looking at the schematic and measuring some signals. And then I found something really interesting on this, uh, on this ROM. What I found was, again, I was just, I was logic probing it and everything kind of looked okay. 
But when I reached, this is pin 12, which is ground, and pin 24 is VCC. And 24 was showing a high, but pin 12 was also showing a high. So, that's kind of weird. I mean, I measured this one, and it had proper VCC and ground, but this one, the, the, the ground pin, was showing high. And I measured it, it was like 3.9 or 4 volts, or maybe even a little higher than that. So, uh, I had to go in there and, of course, investigate a little closer because that kind of pointed to board damage, broken traces or something like that. So, let's pull it out and see if, uh, if we can see anything bad with the socket. Well, the, the, the good news is, is I found something. The bad news is I didn't roll the camera, but uh, I'll show you. So, I pulled this thing out and uh, see how close I can bring it. This is pin 12. That's the ground pin that was showing voltage, a high level on it. And when I pulled it out, essentially the pin was about only about like this long up to here. It was broken off about three quarters of the way up. I checked inside the socket to see if the uh, leftover, the broken off part was still in there, but it wasn't. So, the reason, and that's, the reason why this was happening is, and it happens on some TTL chips too, is if you give them power and no ground and you measure it against ground, the ground pin will a lot of times show you a high voltage level and that's exactly what happened here. So, what I did over here was I took a, uh, a quarter watt resistor cut the lead off and this upper, the fat part of the pin, was still here. And I just soldered that part, the, the resistor leg, to this upper part to generate a uh, to generate a ground connection for this pin. Still doesn't mean that it's going to work, still doesn't mean that it survived, uh, you know, being only having VCC on it and probably getting some parasitic ground through the I.O. pins and I can wreak havoc with it, but uh, let me uh, carefully insert this back in the socket and see if that makes any difference. So I double checked to make sure that the socket actually had ground, and it did, and then carefully inserted this chip back in, making sure that the newly repaired pin or the resistor lead didn't bend out, because it's kind of softer than these pins and it's really easy when you're repairing a pin like that upon insertion to bend the repaired part and start over again. But yeah, that stuff is in, so let's see what it does now. All right. It is starting, it is attempting to read read the disk, but uh, looks like we're having a problem with the video path here, or with one of the video chips. But uh, yeah, let me uh, look at the schematic and kind of follow the video path from the outside in i.e. look at the uh, composite signal going on. I mean, there's something going out, but it's not syncing. So, it's like the sync, wherever the sync is getting mixed in with the video signal, is uh, maybe bad. So, yeah, let's go, and then this time I'm going from the outside in to basically see if, as I go in, is there any point in the circuit where I do see well, I can't really tell from the video signal itself, but I'll have to look in the schematic and see where the sync is generated. Well, I, and I can't even be sure that it's only the sync or the video signal that does this. But uh, let's have a look there and see uh, if the schematics give us any hints. So here's what the schematics have to say. And it looks like, I mean, if we're doing the uh, from the outside in test, here's a composite. Oh, you can't see that. Here is the composite video output, and uh, the waveform 
on this composite output didn't look anything like this. It was basically, I don't know, it, it, it looked, I mean, this, nothing could sync on this signal. It was all over the place, but, you know, we're coming back. We've got a cap in here, we got a 75 ohm to give it a 75 ohm line impedance. Three nickel and dime transistors that are marked as uh, color amps. And then the whole thing's coming out of the GTIA chip. So the sync isn't the sync and video aren't mixed uh, externally, but rather that that's happening inside this chip. So uh, I don't know. There's really there is color in. I'm sorry. There is color information coming from over here that does get that does get mixed in here into the video signal. So there's another transistor here. There's a bank of buffers, CMOS buffers here. And uh, since everything is, since the transistors aren't socketed but this buffer is, let's see if I have one of these and do the easy part first and swap out this buffer. And uh, that guy is here. I did have a replacement. It's a CD4050, by the way. And uh, thanks to the uh, sockets, it's obviously an easy way to replace chips. And uh, let's see what it does now. It's attempting to read the disk. And uh, yeah, we're getting the basic ready prompt out of it. So uh, that buffer here was mangling part of all of the, or all of the video signal, obviously. And that was an easy fix. But we're not there yet. And that's because this is just text. There's no sprites, there's no display lists, i.e. with display lists you can change the color on a per scan line basis. That's how you get the rainbow colored things and stuff. This is just as simple as can be. It's just putting text on a blue background. And what that means is the GTIA is working uh, because that's, that's the actual television interface, but the Antic, which generates sprites and gives you the capability to change colors all over the place and movable objects and and all of that stuff. In order to test that, we're going to have to have to actually run something that exercises the graphics. And for that, we're going to use the gyrus cartridge from before. Oh, well, that's interesting. Oh, it keeps resetting. So the graphics look fine, but it keeps resetting. Let's try some other cartridges. Okay, what do we have? So we have a Spy Hunter. Same thing. The graphics are showing up, but it keeps resetting. Okay, let's let's see if we're dealing with a socket issue here. 
because usually if that chip goes bad you'll see a lot of junk on the screen so let's just kind of lift it out and give the pins a different surface to attach to the socket a different part of the pins so I'm going to kind of pull it out halfway make sure that it still connects not getting too warm Nope, same thing. I don't seem to be affecting it. Yeah, it's doing it all on its own. Let's try one last cartridge. And I have cleaned both the cartridge connect, the cartridge PCB edge and the connector on the board and yeah some a lot of dirt came off the cartridge actually but I tested I've tested all of these cartridges on my own machine and none of them showed any ill effects And this one won't come up at all. Let's put this all the way back in again. So it's either this chip or it's a socket. That's my guess. But Remember, we do have a parts donor machine. So let's go ahead and pull. Oh, wait a minute. I was playing with the Antic. What about the GTIA, which is this one? So let's give this the same treatment. Even though it seemed that the GTIA was working correctly, but they kind of play, I mean, work in concert, so, and that it's resetting. I don't know what other functions these generate that could, you know, that, that are going to cause it to uh, reset whenever a certain part of the code is hit. I'm sure if I put this on a logic analyzer, we can find a correlation to what address space it's getting into when it's resetting, but... Hey, let's do it the easy way still here. The lazy way, I was going to say. So, do we have a socket problem? Interesting. No, it doesn't want to come up at all. All right. We do have a working machine with a working chip in it. And it's going to be one of these two. I think it's going to be one of these two. I mean, it could... There's also the memory management unit. There could also be DRAM errors in here because Basic's probably not using it, whereas the games are using more memory. But again, let's start with the easy part, which is the two display chips. Okay, here's the board out of my machine, the uh, donor board for now. And uh, let's start with the LSI chips. And I think I made a mistake when I pointed out all the chips. I swapped these two. I think I said this was the Antic and this the GTIA. Actually, this is the Antic, and that is the GTIA. So, let's start. With the GTIA. I 
and see if that buys us anything. And see, now you can see the value of uh, labeling these chips because I know exactly which chip came from which machine. All of the ones in here, or the ones I'm going to pull, are labeled number two. And the ones coming out of my original machine are labeled number one. So now... Well, that we already knew, and that's still working. So now let's go back. Okay, Caverns of Mars was having a real hard time. And it still is. How about Gyrus? Look at that, Gyrus is running. Okay. Well, of course it's running because this chip is good, but why wasn't Caverns of Mars running? Let me... Let me give another try at giving the uh, board connector for the cartridge connector another cleaning and see if that makes any difference. So I took the shroud off this. It's not, actually not just a shroud, but actually the Atari cartridges have this locking mechanism where you can't get to the edge, to the card edge connector, but you have to have these two prongs insert and then cartridge opens up. But anyway, squirted some IPA in here and brushed it with a toothbrush. And then I put this thing back again. I put caverns in again. And this time it works. So basically that the connector was a bit dirty, but uh, Looks like with a new Antic chip, the one from my machine, things work. I mean, we need more tests, but, uh, hmm. So let's try the other two cartridges again. That still works, doesn't reset. And we'll test gameplay once we put the keyboard back on, but that seems stable. And Spy Hunter. Comes up. Doesn't reset. And that's interesting, I think it went into automatic demo mode. Or it started a game actually, with the um, old uh, GTIA. But see here, it just sits in the, uh, in the startup screen, it doesn't. So something funny went on here. Well, let's give it uh, one last try and put the uh, original GTIA back in. And... Uh, Oh no, it does. Okay. Okay, so that seems to work. That didn't look too good there. When it reset, you could see garbage on the screen for a while. But that may be inherent in the game. Anyway, let's put the old GTIA back in 
and see if anything's changed. So just for grins I went in and I started pulling the LSI chips to check the uh, sockets, corrosion, you know, misaligned pins or anything like that. And This is a pokey and if you look at this thing closely, it has all the signs of having been desoldered. So what I think happened here is the Pokemaf failed in this at one point in time and they took another board that obviously didn't have sockets or it could have been another machine because several Atari computers use the Pokey chip and they desoldered it. As you can see, you know, the pins aren't straight, there are traces of solder left on some places and that's really interesting because uh, this and another chip show, showed signs of that, so somebody went to town on this and in the process of that, or while troubleshooting, broke this pin, which seemed to be the major problem in here. I mean, preventing it from starting up at all, but obviously we also got a graphics problem. So, uh, I put the old GTIA back in to give it one final chance. Here we are with no cartridge inserted. And we boot into BASIC, no problem. And again, as I said, we'll, we'll test it with the keyboard, but... What happens when we put in caverns? Which we just cleaned up and saw working with the replacement GTIA chip. And that's not even coming up. So, uh, let's try Gyrus again. That's interesting because now, I mean, you guys saw it come up and, and keep resetting, but now it won't work at all. Something really intermittent, and this thing's getting warm. Something really intermittent here is happening. So let's get it back to functionality by putting a known good one in. Yep. I think we identified the next culprit over here. So I'm going to have to dig through my boxes and see if I have any old uh, boards that have a uh, GTIA on it. But the board, in this board itself seems to work just fine. So let's give the keyboard a try. Okay, I plugged in the keyboard. <laughs> we'll boot up into BASIC, of course, to see, uh, to test things. Let's have it print out the memory. Okay, so I guess it's able to utilize with BASIC running about 37, well, approximately 38K of RAM. But not all is well in paradise. So it makes, it makes a click sound every time you hit a key. X key doesn't work. Slash doesn't work. Graphics doesn't work. So, there's several keys.
that don't work. So we're going to have to take the keyboard apart. And I know there's a membrane in there. Remember the Osborne? Well, anyway, we're going to have to open it up and see if there's anything in there that we can clean. But before jumping to any conclusions, I figured let's use the keyboard off of my machine that does work and see if all the keys work so we can isolate whether it's the uh, PC board, the motherboard, or the keyboard itself that's causing the problem. Yeah, that key didn't work before, the slash. Yeah, all of the keys that weren't working with the other keyboard now work. So the problem's definitely in the keyboard. So we have to disassemble the keyboard. It's held to the case with four screws over here. And then it has a gazillion small screws that hold the uh, contact plate or the membrane to the actual key assembly. And here's a very important piece of advice for you to look out to. There is a boatload of springs, one under each key. And uh, always keep the keyboard when you're disassembling it with the keys facing down. Because if you turn it over, all of the springs are going to are going to fall out. They're all loose in there, being held in place by the upper part. And uh, good luck finding all of those springs. They're pretty small. So keep things in this orientation when disassembling the keyboard, starting with these four screws to remove the uh, keyboard assembly itself, and then removing all of the little screws here that hold the keyboard together. So I also noticed there's a whole bunch of these little screws missing here. I mean, you can see there were screws in here, and uh, verify that. Here's my good working keyboard, and you can see several more screws. I mean, all of the small holes have screws in them. Which is not the same. Missing here, missing here. Great. So here's the membrane layers, which I gave a thorough cleaning with window cleaner and let dry. And the way this works is you get a set of contacts on this side and a set of contacts on this side, and then you get a spacer in the middle that essentially keeps the two layers apart until one of the keys is pressed. And that closes the contact. Now when you let go of the key, the spacer forces the uh, contacts apart again. I couldn't, it wasn't dirty or anything in here. But what I did do was I did a continuity test. This is the conductive side over here. And I did a continuity test from where it plugs into the uh, PCB and then gets distributed on the board. And what I found was one of the contacts, let's see if I can do this one-handed, I mean to demonstrate, let's say we use this trace here, and then basically As you traverse the board, you can see them connect. But when I hit this particular one, there was no continuity. So, one, two, three, four over here. There's continuity, and it loses continuity just about. here. And going further down, 
does not connect anymore. But, you know, so right over here is a break, which I'm going to have to repair. And that would account for only some of the keys missing instead of, you know, whole rows or columns missing. I mean, I could sit down and map out and prove that, but it's not worth it because I know that there's a break in here somewhere. Unfortunately, you know, it's at the part where the uh, where the flex connector bends. So let me see if I can repair that in a way where it doesn't break the minute I plug it back into the into the PCB. So after putting the keyboard back together, I used something called wire glue conductive glue and uh, went to the uh, the break was hereabouts couldn't see anything but must have been a hairline crack but anyway I painted over it with the uh, wire glue and there was another funny looking part here which even though it was still conductive conducting from here to here gave that a treatment and had it dry for a bit so uh, Time to see if that would fix the keyboard. Well, fast forward about 24 hours or so. Last night I spent a lot of time on the keyboard. The fix I made with the uh, conductive glue work, ha, ah, great. Well, it kind of worked because the keys that were completely missing came back the one I remember was like uh, the slash key and well those didn't come back but the slash key kind of proves that uh, the connection I made did something but the keyboard got worse it actually, I, I rebuilt it like twice, took it apart, cleaned the contacts on the Mylar, made sure everything was aligned, put it back in, and it kind of worked. There were like a couple of keys that didn't, that were lazy, that I had to press down several times, and then they started to work. But uh, then I thought I'd continue the next day, and when I did, it had kind of regressed, and a lot of keys stopped working again. So. I mean, I did clean the contacts with alcohol again, let them dry properly, but I must have started some chemical reaction because we have a lot of keys not working on this thing now. No, 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 no. And uh, what we can do is put this into the keyboard test. And uh, obviously use that to see what works and what doesn't work but a lot of stuff is not working so press the option key and power it on and we get into the self test so at least the keys on the right side the the function keys or the hardwired keys work now we have to select the test and this is kind of weird because on the LCD monitor one of those lines here is supposed to be highlighted or blinking slowly on and off telling you what you selected but for some reason that's not working i tried this on another monitor and you can clearly see which test is highlighted but on this little monitor you can't so you kind of count you assume that memory was highlighted so i hit the select button once twice keyboard should be highlighted now i hit start and we're in the keyboard test but, you know, trying some keys, spacebar, slash, period, comma. You know, it's almost like I broke another one of those conductors where it connects to the PCB. Or when I bent it, it cracked apart. You yeah, see, here's a good one. You hit the shift key, and it thinks Z is pressed. So at least half the keys aren't working in here. And uh, 
my unprofessional opinion on this is that the, uh, the keyboard's toast, or at least the uh, the contacts on the uh, mylar inside. So it needs a new keyboard. I don't think I haven't done any deep research, but I don't think you can buy just buy the mylar. And this this is probably really bad that you hit the shift. Of course, no, it's not doing it, but yeah, you hit the shift key and it thinks the Z is pressed. That seems to point to a mechanical problem where even though it is assembled correctly, there's a spacer sheet between the two layers of mylar, but uh, I think the mylar is, uh, it's no longer straight. Heat was applied to it and uh, it's sitting at an angle so when like hitting the shift key it bends up just under the Z key and sees that as being pressed. It, there were definitely signs of somebody having tried to repair this before me. You saw a bunch of screws missing from the metal plate underneath the keyboard and uh, the uh, contacts and the mylar had been manhandled in there. You could see that somebody scrubbed it with something and whatever they scrubbed it with, when I lightly cleaned it, first with the window cleaner and then with alcohol, which didn't really remove any dirt, but uh, the keyboard's gone on this. Needs a, needs a new one, which is a shame because the mechanical part is all there, it works. So uh, I officially declare this a parts machine. Because the GTIA chip can be replaced, probably around uh, fifteen dollars or so. I I thought I had some parts machines, but I guess I got rid of those, so I'd have to buy one of those. And the keyboard, I don't know what it costs, and uh, I don't really think it's worth it. At least not for this machine. Oh, and before I forget, the uh, screws that were missing on the bottom plate the keyboard plate. I did replace all of those screws. I found... I do have a large collection of screws, loose screws, and uh, I found something that fit. The threads were a little bit different, but it goes into plastic, so I was able to really tighten that plate. So it's not the plate uh, missing pressure against the bottom of the keyboard or anything like that. Believe me, I tried pretty much everything keyboard's gone. And another issue is these machines are kind of going up in value a little bit because they're one of the only remaining sources for pokey chips. I mean, it's, it's this machine, the 600XL, a couple of other machines, and then there's some cartridges, game cartridges that actually had pokey chips inside of them. And as you can imagine, the prices on those have gone up too. So, uh, but the, the question remains, you know, is it total loss? I mean, the parts machine is never a total loss. But let's see if at least it still fulfills one of its other primary functions. And that is, can you play a game on it? Okay, joystick's plugged in. And off we go. This game is not that easy to play with a joystick. Let's see if I can just make it through the first level. Oh, bother. Ha! Ah, made it to the first level.
Wish I had the arcade game. I mean, the real thing. You know, everybody's all excited over the pokey. This is, the sound is not exactly uh, anything to write home about, but... Ooh, are we going to get past level two, right? Come back here. Come back. Son of a... Okay, got him. Huh? This is like a Galaga ripoff. The challenge state. Hey, 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 come back. Let's see if we can miss them all. <laughs> well, at least you can still play cartridge games on this. I'm not going to bother with uh, testing the disc functionality on this. Uh, but uh, yeah, the game, uh, uh, the game, the uh, machine is probably not salvageable. Well, I mean, anything is salvageable for that matter, right? If you throw enough money at the problem, you can fix it. But my point is that this one's probably not worth it. There are lots of good parts in it, but that's about all it's good for. All right. So anyway, thanks for uh, hanging out. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, we got other neat things coming up. So we'll see you soon. Keep on gaming.